The latest in school segregation was how the headline of a recent New York Times op-ed described private pandemic pods, in which parents get together and hire an in-person teacher while public schools remain remote. The pandemic pod says the writer will exacerbate inequities, racial segregation, and the opportunity gap within schools. Business Insider had a slightly different take. They said the pods were inequitable and inevitable, and that the arrangements were a dream come true for the school choice movement. But are pandemic pods just the latest tool through which white parents use their financial and political clout to separate out their children, thus increasing segregation? And is the solution to increase government spending in K-12 schools so that all parents will want to keep their kids in the public system? That was the subject of an online Soho Forum debate held on Wednesday, September 16th, 2020. Arguing for more government spending was John Hale, a professor of education at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Arguing in favor of pods and other parental innovations was Corey DeAngelis, the director of school choice at the Reason Foundation, which publishes Reason TV. Here's John Hale and Corey DeAngelis in an online debate moderated by the Soho Forum's director, Gene Epstein. Well, again, tonight's resolution reads, to combat inequality, greater investments must be made in public schools so as not to accommodate the formation of pandemic pods by affluent parents. Defending the resolution, University of Illinois education professor John Hale. Opposing the resolution, Reason Foundation senior fellow Corey DeAngelis. I'll be keeping track of time and will briefly interrupt each debater to say when he has five minutes left and one minute left. John, you're first up to defend the resolution. Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, John Hale from the University of Illinois, and it is an absolute, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in such uh, an important debate and question right now in um, really in American history. And um, while I'm Associate Professor of Education and Educational History at the University of Illinois, you know, I come here tonight really as a public education advocate, a father of two little girls, and a very concerned resident of these United States. And tonight, I am here to, again, argue in favor of the resolution, which reads, to combat inequality, greater investments must be made in public schools so as not to accommodate the formation of pandemic pods by affluent parents. And just to be clear, pandemic pods are small groups of students in the K-12 uh, school system who gather together for in-person instruction um, outside of the traditional schooling system, of course, to um, keep safe during this, this pandemic that, that's raging around us. Um, they're also controversial because pods can be pricey, complicated to organize, they're self-selecting, and they're likely to be popular among um, families of privilege and affluence. But to really unpack the resolution and why we should be in favor of it, we are looking at, um, I'm looking at this as a pandemic, but also a dual pandemic. And here I am looking at American Educational Research Association's use of the term dual pandemic and also looking at the American Psychological Association as uh, racism as a pandemic. So really what we're getting here is to look at how we confront a dual pandemic of both COVID and essentially racism. And let me be very clear, first of all, is when I look at race and racial analysis, parents should not be denied the right to form pandemic pods. Um, they have every right to form pandemic pods and to choose to, to form pandemic pods. Nor should parents be told to go back to school if they do not want to physically send their children to school. This is something I understand personally. That's not the debate. The point here is that the focus should be on the fact that policymakers must invest and strategically govern schools to avoid accommodating, and please read here, privileging the formation of pods by affluent parents at the expense of those who cannot afford such luxuries at this moment in time. Public schools must receive the support to operate not only as an effective solution to this dual pandemic, but a safe and decent option for the 51 million children that choose to attend um, a public school. So to unpack this larger debate, I'm gonna 
we'll be focusing on four main talking points. First of which is that pandemic pods are grounded in a racist history and we must look at racism and understand how this is in, impacting uh, pandemic pods. Second, we're looking at parity and, uh, uh, and uh, equal opportunities that do not exist. Parity does not exist, equal opportunities do not exist, that are necessary to make a good choice that the other side will be advocating for, ultimately. And um, what little agency existed prior to the pandemic have been ravaged by this dual pandemic that faces us today. Third, money does in fact matter. And because of that, greater investment is needed. And to this point, I'll also say it's not just financial investment, it can also be non-financial investment as well, which I'll elaborate later. And finally, making greater investments in education restores this perennial vision that education should be a common good um, and all that shares goals of equality. Pandemic pods ultimately move us away from the shared value system. So to look at my first point, pandemic pods are grounded in a racist history and we have to consider the underlying racist principles that form pandemic pods. So to be upfront, of course, there are black and Latinx and indigenous uh, led pods today. Clara Totenberg Green, Mira Debs, J.P. Gerald, Jennifer Berkshire, and others have noted that current pods, however, are compromised by largely uh, white and or economic, economically affluent families. It's been noted in the New York Times and Washington Post and others that upwards of 75% of white people report that when they're making these decisions, that the network of people that they consult with to form pods ultimately, um, they're only discussing this matters with other white people. So in other words, with this largely entirely white uh, social network and with no presence of black families or, or families of color, we can map this out to a racial inequity that underpins the formation of pandemic pods today. And if we look at the broader definition of school choice, and, and to use uh, Dr. DeAngelis' term of what school choice is, anything alternative to um, a public uh, school, right? And pandemic pods fall into that. But other forms of choice also reflect this racialized sort of context. 60% of all homeschooling students, for instance, are white. 60% of private school student population are white. Yet white students make up less than 50% of the traditional public school population. So it is clearly evident that pods are racialized and merely perpetuate a larger racist history. Therefore, to quote uh, Claire Tonberg Green, that it is not a leap to predict that learning pods will mirror the deeply racially segregated lives of most Americans. And this, of course, builds on a much longer history. I mean, we can go back to South Carolina in 1740, Virginia in 1819, other Southern uh, states, that their first educational policy was, in fact, to prohibit and forbid enslaved individuals and enslaved communities the right to read and write to deny enslaved communities a right to an education. Even in the North, as historians have documented, uh, while some opportunity may have been provided to black families and other families of color, it was still largely segregated. So just if you look at the Brown v. Board of Education decision, when in 1954, when the Supreme Court determined that such racial segregation was unconstitutional, right? we see white people pulling out of this system, okay? So here we have a so the sociological phenomenon, of course, of white flight, where white families are leaving the city and urban centers en masse to move to the suburbs and then essentially set up public schools in the suburbs, which are largely segregated just due to residential patterns. We have segregation academies, which are formed by Southern legislatures, with, oftentimes with public money, schools, private schools that are exclusively white as to avoid desegregated public schools. We have freedom of choice plans in which white people argue that there is a constitutional right to freedom of association, which is true, but they apply that right to not have to be forced by gov quote unquote, government schools to go to um, a desegregated public school. This, of course, is the historic basis for school choice that we know today. It's also the basis for this phenomenon we see recently of 
school districts actually seceding, pulling out of public school districts, um, infamous cases in Shelby County and Tennessee around the city of Memphis, okay? Um, and also, as Nicole Hannah-Jones documents very thoroughly, in the state of Alabama. So while people are pulling out again, and by its very nature, it's largely a white-led movement, we must consider race and the institutional racism that's underpinning pandemic powers. This does not mean, of course, pandemic pod parents, if you will, are racist. All it means is that we have to look at the larger systemic nature of racism in public education, something which this forum actually debated a few weeks ago about the police you know, system being racist, and, and the Soho forum agreed to it. So I mean, it's not too much of a jump to see that the school system is racist as well, or I'm, I'm rather it's underpinned by racist policy. My second point uh, is interrelated. Parity does not exist and equal opportunities do not exist for parents who need to make the best choices because they don't exist in order to make the choice to go to the best schools available to them. Not only that, what little agency existed before the pandemic, right, um, has been devastated by this dual pandemic of coronavirus and racism, which has exposed tragic truths. CDC reported, and you can just look at how this pandemic has played itself out, and this is, of course, captured um, uh, the news cycles of, as this pandemic unfolds. Uh, CDC has reported that over 21% of COVID cases in the United States were African Americans and nearly 34% were Latin, uh, Latinx, despite the fact that these groups comprise only 13 and 18% of the U.S. population, respectively. Um, in cases where, you know, for instance, school choice research says uh, will indicate that cities like Milwaukee are doing a really good job in school choice. We actually see African American population in these cities where they suffer nearly four times, and Latinx families suffer six times that the amount of whites in terms of who ends up in a hospital, who comes down with the coronavirus. So it's exposing these tragic racial truths. It also, in terms of the economy, we see that 48% of all adults living in houses where at least one, per one person lose employment income since mid-March or, or the onset of what we um, uh, now know as, of course, the coronavirus pandemic. For Black and Hispanic uh, and Latinx households, rather, this rises to 53 and 62 percent, respectively. We also see that nearly 33 percent of all adults live in households where they expect someone to lose employment, yet with Black and Latinx families, this rises to nearly 50 percent. Additionally, we see that when we were quarantined and sheltering in place, or rather supposed to, we see that in the largest cities in the United States, Black and Latinx families comprise as much as 75% of all the city's essential workers. So essentially, we have a racialized essential working population that has to go back to work, thus expose them to the virus. Let's look at how this plays out within schools. Nearly 17 million children, it is reported, lack access to high-speed internet connection. And it's also been found that one in three Black, Latinx, and American Indian households lack such internet access, making children in these homes much more likely than their white peers to be disconnected from online learning, the format that we've come to depend on during this pandemic. Additionally, social capital is required to understand this convoluted choice process um, such as, you know, educational savings accounts, which requires um, an understanding of a process. It requires a financial investment. It requires social networks with the knowledge to complete the process, to know how to apply and where. It requires time taken out during working hours to decipher this convoluted process. And it also includes uh, a demand for resources, including transportation and proximities, proximity to the very best schools available to us today. So what we need, what we see then with this pan, this dual pandemic essentially, is that the ability for people to make a choice, to even get to the point to make a good choice, greater investment is needed. This leads to my the third point that money matters and greater investment is of course needed. To deny investment in public education starts to border on an extreme position. To ignore the fact that pods and the best choice options do not require investment, once given the choice, is a gross oversight. 
Moreover, it is disingenuous to cut funding while acknowledging that more money is needed. For instance, let's just look at the cost of pandemic pods to begin with. At least reports are coming in that you need at least $30 an hour to hire a tutor or $100 or more to hire a more qualified tutor. Not to mention professionally trained licensed teachers have costs upwards of $100,000 per year for pandemic pods to hire and work with such teachers. This clearly surpasses an $800 to $1,200 a month expenditure for these small pods, which is what a lot of people are paying for, rents and mortgages. So there is an increased expectation that people have to buy into this uh, in order to pay for these pandemic pods. And then, of course, right, money, of course, matters. It costs money to, to uh, organize a pandemic pod. And economists across the board, Kirill Jackson, Bruce Baker, David, Martin, Dar, David Martinez, and others have cited dozens of studies have shown that money matters. Uh, studies across the board show that there's a 10% increase in per pupil spending for each year for all 12 years of public schools leads to um, co more completed years in college, just under one half, 7% higher wages, and 3.2% percentage point reduction in the annual incidence of adult poverty. Uh, Kiribu Jackson, for instance, also finds that a $1,000 reduction in per pupil spending due to the recession, which even happened before the pandemic, of course, leads to a decline in student test scores of about 3.9% of a standard deviation. Money matters. Even Eric Hanischek, someone oftentimes uh, cited by the other side, has recently come out to say that uh, we are uninvesting, underinvesting in education in the United States, and this is a very serious issue, he recognized. Finally, to the fourth point, Making greater investments actually restores a historic vision that education should be a common good. Sometimes, you know, disputed about maybe it's perhaps a public good, but let's draw on the historic language of a common good with goals of equality and opportunity. Historically, national leaders since Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, Benjamin Rush, Noah Webster have published thoughts and philosophies and ideas of their particular educational philosophies, that education must be inextricably linked to the survival of the republic and the democracy. It has been understood since the founding of our nation that education should be a common uh, good to the extent that states have picked up upon the sentiment and enshrined this in state constitutions. Just read, for instance, Arkansas is a, is a good example where it reads, quote, intelligence and virtue being the safeguards of liberty and the bulwark of a free and good in government, this state shall ever maintain a general suitable and efficient system of free public schools. California, a general diffusion of knowledge and intelligence being essential to the preservation of rights uh, and liberties of all people, this legislature shall provide a system of free public schools. This goes on and on to the extent where it is understood that schools should and must be part of this common good of a shared value system. And we have believed this historically to the extent that schools cannot be simplified as a place to simply study a curriculum and to take a test. Schools serve a much larger social function. Schools are the main source of child care for working parents, and we're seeing this during the pandemic. Schools are a key place for children to get healthy meals. Schools are crucial for the health of... Okay, thank you. For the health of all children, schools are especially important for dealing with the mental health of young people. Schools essentially serve as an oasis for children who are suffering from traumatic instances outside of the school. It is a safe haven and a necessary space for tens of millions of children. In short, publication, public education has been seen as a common good and we must continue to invest in this. When we're trying to survive this dual pandemic, greater investment is needed. It's not asking a whole lot. It's just to invest in a system where tens of millions of children must go, either in an online format or in person, to otherwise borders upon an, uh, a posi uh, an extreme position that dismisses both the history of our very system of public education, and it ignores the existing problems that we must address as a nation during this dual pandemic. Perfect. Uh, just three seconds under, John. Um, so uh, you did well. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, now, uh, Corey uh, D'Angelis is up for the negative. Uh, take it away, Corey. All right, cool. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for coming out. And I want to thank uh, John Hale for going over his arguments for his proposal to throw more money at the problem. 
I'm going to argue against that proposal and offer a counterproposal that I think uh, beats his proposal every step of the way. And uh, basic logic would have it, if you prefer my proposal to John Hale's proposal, that would have you reject uh, John Hale's proposal to throw more money at the public school system. Uh, my proposal is to fund students directly instead of institutions and allow students to take their education dollars to whatever educational setting works best for them. And that still could be the traditional public school system. If that works for a particular family and if the traditional public school system is high quality for, for their family and if uh, the school has a great reopening plan that works for them, families should absolutely be able to continue choosing that. But if for whatever reason that does not work, the, the money should follow the child, the money that already exists in the education system for that child should follow them to wherever they're getting an education. That can be in a private school to pay for tuition and fees, and that could be in a pandemic pod, which is the main point of this uh, discussion today. And I will say this should lead to more equality because advantaged folks are already going around and forming pandemic pods. Advantaged folks can already afford to pay for private school out of pocket. My uh, proposal leads to more equality of opportunity by allowing for less advantaged families to have the means to be able to pay for these uh, alternatives as well. And this is similar to how we uh, fund so many other taxpayer funded initiatives from Pell Grants to pre-K programs to food stamps. With all these other initiatives, the funding rightly goes to the families and then the families have a choice of where to spend that money. With food stamps, you can choose, the, the money goes to the family and the family can choose to spend the money at Walmart, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's. We should do the same thing when it comes to K through 12 education. Uh, so I, I think we should fund the student instead of the system. We should fund the student instead of the institution, just like we do with all of these other programs. And after all, the money is supposed to be meant for educating the child. It's not supposed to be meant for propping up and protecting a government-run monopoly. Everybody in here would think it would be absolutely ridiculous if, you're, if we forced low-income families to take their food stamps to a residentially assigned government-run grocery store. It's absolutely ridiculous. Similarly, in the K-12 education, to not allow families to have the choice to take their children's education dollars to wherever they're getting a proper education. Uh, so that's my main, main proposal. And I would also argue that it should be tied to a percentage of what is already spent in the traditional public school system. We already spend around $15,000 per child per year in the traditional public school system. And that amount has increased by 280% in real terms since 1960. It's nearly doubled since 1980. And it's increased by around 40% in inflation adjusted terms since 1990. I think it should be about 80% of the money that already exists in the system. This could create a, a taxpayer savings. It doesn't have to be that way, but this is one way to ensure that there's e either fiscal neutrality or a taxpayer savings with my proposal. John Hale's proposal, I would imagine, would take a, a lot of money. He didn't really give us a number as to how much money is enough uh, with, when it gets to greater investments. I guess we'll get into that in the next uh, five-minute segment, but I didn't hear any amounts of how much this is going to take for more equality in the traditional public school system. But my incentive has a lot of benefits along with it. We don't have to guess about how much the money is going to cost. I already told you it's going to be 80% or higher or some number around there of the 15000 that we already spend. Some states spend less, some states spend more. So it would be relative to what your child would have gotten in the traditional public school system. Hale's proposal assumes that incentives do not matter. So you can throw more and more money into a system and it could matter it, and it could matter for student outcomes in certain locations, but it's, it's not going to matter if there are no incentives to spend that money wisely on the individual student. And I would argue the traditional public school system has a lot of monopoly power in that individual families in the current system are residentially assigned to a particular school uh, just based on where they live. And so that provides a lot of monopoly power in addition to compulsory funding through property taxes. And so uh, since they know they have your money regardless, and, and since the transaction costs are high for, for switching to another school, there's a lot of monopoly power in the residentially assigned traditional public school system. Just imagine if you were residentially assigned to your nearest grocery store, they wouldn't really have a strong incentive to do a good job because they know that they would have you on the hook as a customer. And I think this whole debate about the school reopenings has more to do with incentives. And I will say my proposal does allow for bottom-up incentives and accountability to be introduced into the system by allowing individual families, not just rich families, less advantaged families as well, to vote with their feet to the provider of the educational service that works best for them. And that could lead to improvements in the traditional public schools as well. And we have 28 studies on this topic, what happens in response to private school choice competition in the traditional public schools for the children who remain in those schools for whatever reason. 26 of the 28 studies find statistically significant positive competitive effects 
on the children who remain in the traditional public school system. So this could be a tide that lifts all boats. And just think about uh, the reopening plans of different businesses today. Private businesses, including private schools and daycares, are fighting to reopen, but public schools all too often are fighting to remain closed. And I think the difference here is one of incentives. One of these sectors gets your money regardless of how well their reopening decision works for their customers. And if you look at the Education Week database on this, covering over 900 school districts in the United States, which covers around 40% of all students in the traditional public school system, uh, Around three quarters of the 100 largest school districts in that data set are not reopening with any in-person instruction available to any students uh, at all. And if we would expect that more money would lead to better reopening plans or better educational outcomes, we would think that our NAEP scores would, would have gone up over time. But we essentially see a huge increases in spending over time, but then uh, pretty flat uh, standardized test score outcomes when it comes to the NAEP long-term trend. Uh, uh, data on this. But then also, uh, we, we should also expect that in the Education Week data set that we would see that districts that spend more money should be more likely to reopen in person if it's all about the financial, uh, uh, if it's all about the, the finances in the system. But if you pull up the Education Week data and do a simple correlation between spending per pupil in the school district and whether they reopened in person or not, it's actually a negative correlation. You would expect it to be a positive correlation if more money led to being more able to uh, reopen in person. And this relationship, this negative relationship, which is pretty shocking, uh, stays, stays uh, significant and negative even after controlling for a whole bunch of different demographic characteristics such as the racial composition, composition in the area, the age distribution in the area, and even median household income in the area. I think it has more to do with politics and power dynamics than it does with the amount of money that's in the system. I mean, just think about D.C. public schools in my area. They spend over $31,000 per child per year, yet they're not reopening for in, any in-person instruction until at least November 6th. Um, and so they spend way more than the national average, uh, uh, a little over twice the national average, and they're not, they're not reopening in person. But then you have Florida that spends much less than the national average, and 73% of the school districts in Florida are reopening with, with full-time in-person instruction available to all students, despite not having a ton of resources at a per, on a per-people basis. But then you look at states like California that have stronger teachers unions and spend more than Florida, and they only about 4% of the school districts in the Education Week database reported that they're going to uh, reopen full-time uh, with in-person instruction for all students. So California has stronger teachers unions and spends more, yet they're less likely to reopen. And then if you look in D.C., I already told you how much the public schools spend. The charter schools spend less than the, the traditional public schools in D.C. They actually spend about 29% less on a per-people basis in the traditional public schools in D.C., yet the charter schools are sending me things in the mail about uh, hybrid options available to students and also full-time virtual learning if, if parents want that as well. So they're more likely to give uh, families options. But you would expect if the money was the, the big deal about the reopening, then the charter schools should be less likely to reopen in person, but they're actually more likely to reopen in person. And I think that has to do with two things. Charter schools are a lot less likely to be unionized than the traditional public schools, and charter schools have a more competitive incentive to get it right because they know they need to advertise to the parents in order to give them something that the individual families want. And a lot of families do want some type of in-person instruction for their families but they are still offering the full-time uh, virtual school option as well in the charter schools in D.C. So I don't think it's a big uh, money issue. And although John didn't tell us how much money he's going, he, he would like to pour into the system, there are some unintended impacts of increasing taxes to pay for this. Um, and I would expect it would be a lot of money, but uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. But if you increase the property taxes, that could increase the price of renting that unit, unit, and that could hurt disadvantaged communities by increasing their rent prices through indirectly through raising property taxes. That could also, if it's funded through sales tax, that could hurt uh, disadvantaged communities by not allowing them to, to, to consume at the same rate. And it could also shutter their employment opportunities, and then that could lead to unemployment for disadvantaged communities as well. So, and then I'm not sure if the schools are going to reopen if, even if there are, are greater investments in the school system. And so with John Hale's proposal, we have to do a lot of assumptions about the schools making the right decision and, and actually reopening. And I'm not sure if they'll actually do that. They may spend the money on other things. Just look at the CARES Act funding. We've already allocated over $13 billion to K-12 education from the federal government, yet the schools aren't reopened. That's about 
a quarter of what the federal government spends in total on K through 12 education each year. So we've already poured a lot of money into the school system and they're not reopening. Um, but also the schools may, yeah, they may get more money and then just say, oh, we reassess the uh, situation. We actually asked for a hundred billion, but you know what? We think we need 150 billion. And I think that has to do with incentives. They have a pretty strong incentive to remain closed. Just imagine if Walmart got your grocery money each week and you had to continue paying them regardless of their decision to reopen. They would have a much different incentive than what they do have today. Uh, my proposal beats Hale's proposal in a couple of other ways as well. My proposal uh, uh, gets into, so you don't have to assume goodwill on the, for, on the side of the traditional public schools, because even if the traditional public schools don't make a good reopening decision, or they don't invest the money wisely and do a good job, then the families would still be able to uh, opt out. But if the schools do make a good decision, then the families would still be able to pick their traditional public schools. So we don't have to make an assumption about what the schools are going to do with the money because if they don't make the right decision, people could vote with their feet and take their money elsewhere. I mean, if a Walmart doesn't reopen, you can take your food stamps elsewhere. You can take your, your money elsewhere. If a school doesn't reopen, each family should be able to take their child's education dollars elsewhere at the same time. My proposal allows for individual needs to be met. Hale's proposal is a one-size-fits-all solution that might not work it for everybody. A school reopening plan may work for a lot of uh, individual families, but per perhaps you're from a, a family where you're living with your grandparents and the student um, has a high-risk condition for the virus. Maybe that school reopening plan still doesn't work for them in the public school system. So maybe it would still be beneficial for them to be able to use that money to go to a pandemic pod. Uh, and so that allows for this uh, recognition of individual needs that aren't the same as the needs of perhaps the majority. And even with, uh, it, even if you have access to a, a quote unquote high quality public school, it might not be a good match for every individual child. It, they may not be interested in it. They may be getting bullied in that public school system. And I still think they should be able to have a choice as well. Because look, again, rich people, ri yep, rich people already have school choice. They can already afford to pay for a property that's residentially assigned to the best traditional public schools in the current system. Rich people can already afford to pay for private school out of pocket. Rich people can already afford the, to have the option of the pandemic pods. All I'm saying is that we should allow other people to have that option as well. Even if Hale's proposal is correct in that putting more money into the public school system incentivizes families to go back into the traditional public school system, those advantaged families will still have the power to make the choice to exit that system. So they would still have that choice. So it doesn't really lead to equality of opportunity, which funding the students directly would give more families that ability to make that choice. Even if it's the public school system, they should still be able to make that choice. My uh, proposal is safer in theory if you believe in social distancing. My proposal allows families to exit the public school system and spread out to uh, other locations with smaller class sizes in private schools, but then also pandemic pods, which are smaller locations. And that'll in decrease the class sizes in the traditional public schools as well. Hale's proposal is instead trying to incentivize people to stay in the traditional public school system, which um, would, could lead to less social distancing and less safety. And again, uh, this also assumes that the families are choosing the pandemic pods only because of safety. And it could be that the, the traditional public schools spend the money on things that do make the schools a little bit safer. But for the individual families, they may say that, well, this isn't safe enough. I would still like the pandemic pod because this is kind of a big factory warehouse setting. You, I know you have all of the uh, equipment and, and materials. So the family still may not go back into the traditional public school system. And even if they did go back into the traditional public school system, the traditional public school system is inherently uh, unequal that you have certain families that are residentially assigned to higher quality traditional public schools. Then you have others that are not assigned to the, to the high quality schools and they're stuck in the failing traditional public schools. So even if Hale gets his proposal correct, it would incentivize families to go back into their original schools. And I don't see how that could lead to more equality. Mine doesn't, uh, eradicate inequality entirely, but it does lead to more incentives for bottom up accountability for the lower quality schools to improve. And it does give disadvantaged families options right now. And that's another point is that Hale's proposal could take a long time. Look, we've already been waiting a long time for the schools to reopen and high, high income families, affluent families have already been accessing alternatives to the system for the past few months. I don't think low income families should have to wait any longer. They should be able to access these alternatives like the affluent families right now. And the best way to do that in a quick manner is to allow the funding to follow the child to wherever they're getting an education. 
Uh, and so with Hale's proposal to, you know, kind of invest in the traditional public school system, a lot of the issues about the safely reopening schools have to do with the buildings themselves and the, the, the you know, the, like the, the, the high, high class sizes and the, and the big uh, structure of the school buildings themselves. And so reshaping the buildings could take a long time, which uh, low income families shouldn't have to wait any longer. Advantaged families haven't had to wait at all. And with school choice, the disadvantaged families wouldn't have had to wait for the past couple of months either. Uh, and then also, uh, we don't know how much money this is going to take. With my proposal, we know how much money it's going to take. Health's proposal will be an increase in expense. Mine will be a, theoretically, it could be a decrease in taxpayer expense, but it also uh, could be a budget neutral um, uh, proposal as well. Uh, so in summary, just to hit it really quickly, my proposal beats Hales in that it uh, costs less, doesn't cost more, and doesn't come along with all the unintended consequences of raising uh, rent on people, raising uh, sales tax for people, or uh, putting people out of business by increasing corporate income taxes or ho however it's going to be funded. My proposal allows for, uh, considers the needs of individual families, which could differ from the one-size-fits-all approach in the traditional public school system. Uh, and each child is unique, and so they should be able to sort based on those unique interests and needs that they have and their individual family circumstances. Hale's proposal doesn't introduce any new competitive incentives for the public school system to spend that money wisely. So we have to do a lot of assuming about how the schools are going to spend the money. Uh, with my proposal, it allows for additional competitive pressures for the public schools to get better and then for students to be able to access schools that are uh, better for them. Uh, also, the Hale's proposal does not expand opportunity for disadvantaged communities. They still just have to wait on the government to uh, improve their education system. They Low-income families have been waiting decades already for the government to pour more money into the public school system to improve, and they haven't seen those improvements. They shouldn't have to wait anymore. They should get the money right now, and it should follow their child to a better educational option. And I can get into this a little, little later. I know I'm a little over, but uh, my proposal, uh, well, it could lead to more safety by spreading uh, children out in more locations, could lead to more equality of opportunity, and it could benefit teachers too. We already have evidence it's of teachers up, <laughs> exiting the public school system for pandemic pods. Thanks. That was uh, five seconds over for Corey, so uh, we won't find you too bad, too badly for that. Uh, no. uh, but I had uh, technical difficulties. I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, no, no. Actually, no, actually, Corey. You, you considered it, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm very flexible. I gave you the 10 seconds. But uh, you guys are doing well in terms of time, both of you, uh, no problem at all. Uh, and now we go into the rebuttal portion. That's five minutes apiece. Uh, so, uh, uh, John, uh, you get uh, your chance at rebuttal. Take it away, John. Okay, you know, Corey, there was a lot said. I'm going to try to respond what I can. I'm going to try to, to break it down to, um, I think, the most essential points. And part of that, I'm going to say, just requires a, about what my, um, it's not a proposal as much as the defense of Black families, Latinx families, and families of color in public schools. That investment is needed. So, and in terms of, I feel a little pressure to put a number on that, but let me explain where I'm coming from with greater investments. And I'm coming at this from a historical point of view and a social a political point of view as well is that investment can mean more money. It can mean more money. Um, in many ways, it should be because I've, I've been and worked and organized around many of these schools where, where, where you do need more money, but that later. But it can also mean, you know, if you look at when the first pandemic pod uh, news hit the summer, like JP Gerald and Mira Debs said, one way to invest is it's not necessarily spend more money, it's showing up to pressure the public schools to do the right thing. That's an investment. If you're forming a, a pandemic pod and you are worrying about paying the best teacher you can and staying safe, right, you're pulling out of that system. You're pulling out of the public discourse to, sh to pressure unions to do the right thing and to pressure your local school to do the right thing. So investment also includes that. And also in terms of, I'm not going to put an exact number on it because it, our, as you know, Corey, right, our, and, and hopefully people in the audience, I assume we all do, how incredibly complicated our funding structure is in the United States, local, state, federal. And even I, I spent seven years uh, teaching in, in Charleston, South Carolina. It's a hundred mile long school district. And you know, you could break down numbers about per student expenditures, even within this district. And it looks quite different. I mean, schools that were purportedly failing its students received more than the best performing public schools in the area. So something there's intra-district disparity that these sort of broad numbers just don't cover. But let me get back to this point of investment. What I'm 
proposing, if you will, but what I'm really defending and asking you to consider, no matter how you vote on it tonight, whatever, it's to just take the idea that investment means believing in and empowering and uplifting those who have been historically disenfranchised by a racist public school system. Who are you, you mentioned like for decades, people have been asking and waiting for the government to do something. They've been, people have been waiting. Families of color, black families in particular, and coming from the South for the past 10 years, are not waiting. They're already demanding change and people aren't listening. An investment could be simply listening to what people want in their schools. I trust parents in public schools. I trust parents who choose public schools. They know more than I do sitting here coming from afar in Champaign, Illinois, telling them what, what they need to do. No, they knew, they knew best. They know best. It's a, it, it's a problem that extends itself to the civil rights movement. Here we're looking at none other than Septima Clark, Ella Baker, Bob Moses, Dave Dennis. I can go on and on and on that solutions are held in the community. I want to empower those communities and I'm going to listen to them as they tell Tell me what investment they need, because that is the solution. And just something else, I think, for the remainder of the minutes, I'm, you know, personally, and I know a lot, I've heard a lot of people coming forward with articles, what, what not tonight. I'm very highly uncomfortable with this idea about comparing schools, which my daughters are going to go to, to a Walmart, to compare their going to school like it's using a food stamp. That, you know, schools, as I mentioned in my opening, and I'll, and I'll say it again because I think it was um, perhaps missed or just, you know, there's a lot happening, right, um, especially with faulty Zoom wires, that schools are much more than a place just to learn a curriculum, that just to go and listen to a teacher and take a test, right? That's one way to look at what schools provide health, uh, health and well-being for our students. Stu schools can and should be a safe place for students coming from traumatic backgrounds or experienced trauma in the pandemic, the dual pandemic has exacerbated this, right? Schools are uh, not only a safe place, but they are a meeting place for people to try to improve our democracy. So to try to put one single number on that and try to say like, this is like a Walmart. I, I, I don't want to go send my daughters to a school that's like Black Friday and people are like, mobbing each other to get the best product. I don't, I don't want a teacher who's paid as much as a greeter. And I love the greeters at Walmart, don't get me wrong, but they're underpaid and, and they're honestly are not insured properly. I don't want to send my school, my kids to a Walmart. And even I've heard before like a Trader Joe's or something. Okay, well then it's a grocery that's in a gentrified white area and you're limiting the choice. So I, I think that they're, you know, a better analogy than food stamps and Walmart that's not the school that I'm talking about. That's not the school that historically we're talking about. And quite frankly, in this pandemic, we're talking about safe spaces for our students. Oh yeah, yeah. okay, you just went uh, nine seconds over, so we're all fine. Uh, but uh, thanks, uh, thank you, John. And um, uh, then uh, hold on a second, I've got to clear this. And um, so Corey, you've got a uh, five minute rebuttal. Uh, take it away, Corey. Cool, thank you so much, uh, John, uh, for going over the rebuttal points. Uh, I, I, I would still like to know how much more investment is needed in the traditional public school system. And I know it's really difficult to come pin down a, a, a number, but this is the argument that's made over and over again over the past few decades is we need a little bit more money. We'll, we'll do better this time, we promise. We need a little bit more money. And we've increased every single decade on the US on the national average per pupil expenditures after adjusting for inflation. Since 1960, it's increased by 280%. So I, I really would like a number. I'm, I'm giving people a number. I'm saying it's 80% of what they would have gotten in the traditional public school system. And that's another benefit of my proposal that it's there's more certainty. You don't have to do all this guesswork. And it's not something that we've tried a million uh, times before. Uh, and I want to just clarify really quickly with the Walmart analogy. I'm not saying schools are Walmarts. That's why I also try to uh, put in the analogy of pre-K programs and Pell Grants, which those are uh, educational institutions where the money goes to the family and the family has a choice in the matter. And a lot of the people who do not like uh, uh, K through 12 having the funding follow the child uh, will support pre-K uh, funding following the child and Pell Grant funding follow the child, which the only reason I can kind of conjure up as to why you would be for one and not the other is there's an entrenched special interests in protecting the status quo when it comes to K through 12 education, whereas in pre-K and in and, and higher ed, the, uh, the default is more choice and more freedom already. And we already have systems where people can take their money to uh, particular institutions. Um, I just wanna get 
uh, re re respond to a couple of points. John Hill pointed out that 50, 51 million students choose to attend public schools in the United States. They don't make that choice. They make that choice because it's uh, that's the only choice that they have, and they don't they can't afford to pay twice to pay for a private school out of pocket for, while paying for the traditional public school. Um, through the property tax system. If people had the choice, many more would choose private schools and pandemic pod options. Um, and I think John Hill understands this because he said this in his uh, recent podcast where he believes that uh, allowing the money to follow the child would be a, quote, devastating blow to the public school system. Why would it be a devastating blow to the public school system? It's, it's an admission that when people are given the option, there won't be 90% of kids in traditional public schools. They'll go somewhere else because they like the alternative options, even when they're given less money than what is spent on them in the traditional public school system. Uh, and I also want to point out uh, John Hill spent a lot of his time talking about racist origins of school choice or the apparent racist origins of school choice. I will argue that school choice uh, it, uh, was around long before the 1950s. We'd have, we've had three private school voucher programs in the United States that started in the late 1800s in Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire, and those didn't have racist origins. And I also will say in the 1950s, people opposed school choice. Segregationists actually proposed, uh, opposed school choice because they knew it would allow other students into their schools and it would allow for more racial integration. And in fact, if you look at the evidence on the private school choice literature, there's only eight or nine studies on this. All but one of those studies find that on net, school, private school choice programs today lead to racial integration because it allows for students to escape racially segregated schools. And we cannot forget that the traditional public school system is a segregated system. John Hale also pointed out that uh, and conceded that tr the traditional public school system, there are aspects of systemic racism in it. And that's a good argument for school choice. Why force people into a system that suffers from systemic racism? Why not allow people to vote with their feet uh, and to go to an alternative uh, situation? John Hale also pointed out that, the, and I'm glad he pointed out that there's a lot of success with school choice in Milwaukee. And I just want to thank him for making my argument for me. Um, there have been two random assignment studies in Milwaukee. Both have found some suggestive evidence of winning a lottery to attend a private school in Milwaukee uh, would increase standardized test scores. But we've seen other matching studies find in increases in college enrollment and high school graduation rates. And then also one of my studies I've done with Patrick Wolf has found a reduction in criminal activity in two different peer-reviewed studies in Milwaukee. Uh, so thanks so much for you know checking that out. I also want to point out to listeners uh, something that I thought was disturbing. John Hill pointed out that uh, uh, some families may not have the social networks and knowledge to do the process, but a lot of processes take a lot of information to gather. But you know, I don't have to be a medical doctor to choose my doctor. I don't have to. And, and with food stamps, that it, it takes a lot. It's very difficult to fi find the right foods for your family. Should we take away food stamps from disadvantaged families just because it takes some information gathering? No, we should still give them that power to make that choice. Um, even if it's a difficult decision for them to make. And I think all families have the best incentives and information about what their own children need more so than a bureaucrat sitting in an office hundreds of miles away. 10 seconds over and also. All right, that's fine. Uh, okay, thank you for that uh, rebuttal. And now we go to uh, the Q&A portion of the evening. Uh, and... Uh, uh, the, the loose rules are that either of you have the prerogative to ask the other a question at any time. Let's begin by asking John at this point. You can uh, reserve the right to do so later. At this point, is there a question that you would like to put to Corey? Or do you want to wait and, and wait for audience questions or whatever? But do you want to exercise that right at this point? Yeah. Can I just clarify or ask a clarifying point about... Um Milwaukee and why that works, and I still haven't really received a direct response to about the pandemic of racism. I mean, you're talking about low income, which seems to be, you know, loosely, you know, correlated, or you're using it as a way to talk about race. So just clarify about Milwaukee specifically and why it's working, just maybe just something to talk about. And then also how, when we talk about, um, I'll start with that one question, Milwaukee, and then connecting to that, how does following the money, or if I'm putting money so that the money follows a student, right? So empowers students through this sort of, um, you know, handout, if you will, or check, right? You're, you're giving students a voucher to 
go over to, to use the schools, right? So how does that still meet the historic and social function of schools that have been established since ultimately the 18th century? Yeah, I want to point out that if you ask minority families if they like school choice, they're much more likely to support school choice than white families. So I think, uh, you know, when you ask them, you know, what, what, what uh, minority families want, we should allow them to make a choice in the matter. Um, and so, yeah, it's not just low-income families who want school choice. It's all sorts of families who want school choice. And in Milwaukee, it's not the only place that has found positive effects of school choice programs. We have charter schools all across the nation uh, in most states. About 45 different states have charter schools. Uh, with voucher programs, there's 17 experimental studies of the effects of private school voucher programs on test scores. And the majority of those have found statistically significant positive effects on, for overall or for some subgroups of students. And only one of those experimental, two of those experimental evaluations of the 17 have found statistically significant negative effects. So it's, it's hard to tell exactly what's causing the difference in outcomes, because even if you have a gold standard evaluation, it's something called a black box intervention, where you know that, you know, winning the lottery is what caused the better outcomes. We don't know the exact mechanisms of what's going on. A lot of people have theorized about what could cause the difference in outcomes. One of the best main theories is that it, it's competitive pressures. And I will say there are the 28 other studies that I cited at the beginning of this. 26 of 28 have found positive competitive effects on the traditional public schools. So the traditional public schools respond pretty positively uh, for the most part, if you look at the evidence on that as well. And um, just because something has existed for a long time doesn't mean that that's the best system for each individual family now. And I'm not calling to eliminate the public school system. I, th I think that should still be part of the choice set. People should still be able to choose. I, I, I made sure I started with that. People should still be able to choose the public school if that works for them. But if it doesn't, they should be able to select some other option uh, that is more able to cater to their individual needs. So, John, you put a, put a fine point on the answer. John was pressing for an explanation about why Milwaukee and other places have a greater success. You mentioned competitive pressures. Could you elaborate on that for in terms of John's question for the moment. Yeah, the private schools uh, have a strong incentive to cater to their needs of their customers because they know that those families can take their money elsewhere. So because private schools have a strong incentive to cater to the needs of those families, that could lead to better outcomes uh, through the voucher program because they're able to access schools that already have those incentives to, to do a better job. All right, and then uh, Bulls, in your court, do you want at this point to exercise the option of putting a question to John? Or do you want to waive that? Um, right. Yeah, so I, I guess uh, one of my main questions for John is uh, based on what I pointed out about that uh, podcast where he said that he believed that if we had a situation like ESAs or having the money follow the child, he believes that it would be a, quote, devastating blow to the public system. Why would giving families a choice be a devastating blow to the system that they're residentially assigned to? Um, so, you know, Focusing on greater investments, which is the resolution before us, so that greater investments need to be made. And this is a um, comment that I'll put into context because you asked specifically. But to make greater investments, we have to understand that privileging and accommodating choice at this point in this historic moment in the United States can have a devastating impact. Let's just look at educational savings accounts, for instance. So when we, when I hear other sides talk about educational savings accounts, and it, we just and a lot of economists, right, seem to assume that this is already an equal playing field, right? However, why is it then, if it is an equal playing field, right, why do we have so many Black and Latinx and Indigenous American families without uh, a savings account in the banks whatsoever? So we assume that giving families and uh, students more choice we're assuming there's an equal playing ground, but it's not, right? We can't make that assumption. So if we all of a sudden say, okay, we're going to move to educational savings account, and if I'm not mistaken, you actually called educational savings account a panacea um, at one point, um, or alluded to the fact that it can, it can raise all boats, that in fact, if you actually look at what's going to happen if you went to educational savings account immediately, there's no parity and opportunity to even put it into savings accounts. Right. In, in some studies, less than 70 to 75 percent of black Atlantic families even have a savings account as they exist by some studies. And when you look at the historic distrust of black and Latinx families in banks, that that doesn't seem to be a fair option to just look at one example of choice. 
So that can have a devastating impact if you all of a sudden start to create these savings accounts. And in Arizona, we, we, we've seen money being transferred from public schools to these savings accounts that really doesn't work in terms of providing, quote unquote, more choice. Also, historically, I, I got to correct that. That's just simply, you know, school choice didn't exist from the beginning of the founding of public education in, 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 in the United States. School choice specifically is, has been traced with consensus among historians to Milton Friedman in 1955. Now, Robert Gross is talking about it, but school choice, how we use it today, how we use it today is largely credited with school choice. So providing that choice always has this problematic relationship to racism. And when we propose choice as a solution, we're not taking into account the uneven playing field that already exists. That is why greater investment is needed to even make that choice, to even to, to allow people to sort of empower their individual lives, right? To empower, to make decisions, to be empowered, to invest in such savings accounts, right? That is why choice can have a very negative effect on, uh, on on families of color today. All right, and John, uh, John, I believe that you had a second question you wanted to put to Corey, having to do with race. Yeah. So okay, and then also when you so Milwaukee is very interesting. I'm from the great state of Wisconsin, out in the country, but you know Milwaukee. More power to Milwaukee. We've seen a miss when we're talking about Milwaukee. What the historic origins of the voucher and, and choice program there? Howard Fuller, who I've interviewed extensively and then, you know, basing a chapter on him in my forthcoming book, check it out. Maybe Gino will send the Amazon link out later. But um, this actually grows out of the civil rights movement as a way to um, provide community control to the black community in the city of Milwaukee. Derek Bell, founder of Critical Race Theory, came to Milwaukee to argue that perhaps this public system isn't working. We need to have a community-controlled system. And that's what they proposed. Choice and vouchers are sort of a negotiated compromise after that. And Howard Fuller has been critiqued heavily for that. He's oftentimes associated as, as one of the strongest but very few black voices in, in, terms, in, in favor of school choice. I don't think that's right. But what I'm saying is... You know, we need to see how choice evolved in Milwaukee to understand what the, what the issues going on in Milwaukee. Also in the city of Milwaukee, we have the, pan, the dual pandemic that ravages that city. Four times as many African-American families in the city of Milwaukee. Six times the Latinx families in the, in the city of Milwaukee come, are, are, are stricken with the coronavirus, right? So it still begs the question, why are we going to disinvest for a voucher system that affects so few people at a, at a national scale to point to cities like Milwaukee and Cleveland, I saw come up as a national solution? It just, to me, doesn't make sense. And I just got to say a little bit, when we're talking about what the solutions that need to happen, to point to Milwaukee, that's a majority minority city, where the majority of that city, or in the school system at least, or like Chicago, and you point to and you handpick a few studies and say this is what's, what's going on. It's a little bit like white people, I'm sorry, pointing to a black friend and saying, look, I have a black friend, I'm not racist. Right, it's, it's pointing to these individual studies to say, "Look, this is actually benefiting people," and it's not. There is systemic racism that needs to be addressed. So Josh, okay, that okay. Then that was a statement, and I guess the question is, uh, could you respond to that? Those objections about Milwaukee. Uh, please answer the question, Corey. Yeah, I also just want to point out really quickly that voucher programs did exist in New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont. Anybody could look it up on Google right now, and I'll send it in the comments in a second. They've existed since the 1800s, in the late 1800s in the U.S. And either either way, I mean, in the 1950s, there were people that were segregationists that opposed school choice, and there were segregationists that approved of school choice. There were differences. But then also, this is a genetic fallacy. You can't base the uh, the benefits of a policy today and the motives of a policy today based on uh, how some people felt about the policy a long time ago. Uh, and I wonder if John Hale is against the minimum wage uh, because the minimum wage has racist origins too. Uh, you, I guess you can just, nod or nod or are you, are you um, against the minimum wage? Could, yeah. could you go ask the question about Milwaukee, uh, uh, please? Go. Yeah, so I didn't cherry pick studies. I, I did go over some studies in Milwaukee, but I cited the preponderance of the evidence in Milwaukee. 
if you want to, if you want me to cite more, I can go through all of the studies in Milwaukee. And there are five competitive effects studies from Milwaukee, all finding statistically significant positive effects in the traditional public schools. But I also cited all 17 experimental studies. I didn't just cite Milwaukee. Um, and I went through all of those. And I also just want to point out for the listeners really quickly that each experimental study isn't really a fair experiment because the, the voucher programs are funded much less than the traditional public schools. So when you find a null effect, no effects on test scores, for example, that implies a positive return on investment because the, the voucher schools are using lower funding amounts from the state than the traditional public schools. All right. Um, I, at this point, at this point, uh, I should probably pay some attention to a lot of audience questions that are coming in. Uh, John and, uh, and Corey, you'll have the opportunity to ask each other questions a bit later. Uh, one question for you, uh, Corey, has been that in your initial statement, you were constantly using reopenings as a criteria for uh, the effectiveness of the public schools versus the private school. There seemed to be a doubt on the part of some questions as to whether reopenings are a useful criterion. Could you address that objection? Yeah, the reason I was pointing out so much about uh, the reopening debate today is because it's it's relevant today, but then also the start of the pandemic pods, at least in, in current memory, is that a lot of families were are seeking out pandemic pods because the schools aren't reopening for in-person instruction. And um, I would expect that one of Hale's arguments is that if, if you have greater investment, whether that's through money or, or otherwise in the traditional public school system, some of the families that exited the system because of the schools not reopening would come back into the schools. And that's how you would uh, have more, uh, you know, kind of equality under his um, proposal. And so that's why I addressed uh, the school reopenings with in great detail. But we could also talk about um, kind of just investments in schools over time and and academic outcomes too, if we, if we want to talk about those. But Okay, uh, John, uh, do you want to uh, comment on Corey's response? Do you want to go on to another question? Uh, up to you, John. I mean, there's a lot of fascinating questions coming in, but, um, okay. you know, let, let, there's a lot to say. I, I just want to say when we look at sort of like investment in a time and, and then we're going back to this argument time and time again that, you know, this isn't taken away from um, public school investment. I just want to point when we look at the CARES Act specifically, that one of the biggest problems we had are senators proposing legislation and Southern governors, such as um, Governor McMaster in, in, the, in the state of South Carolina, where they're actually using that CARES Act money to fund private school vouchers, to fund private school options. So it's a very actually real threat during this pandemic that money is being proposed by our current administration and current senators who want, and, and not to mention Southern governors like McMaster, who are using that money supposed to address the, just the singular pandemic of coronavirus. And I, and I put it into the private school funds. So, I mean, I think it's a little bit, again, disingenuous to say that, well, you know, people, public education advocates are, are you know, are, making a false claim that we're taking money away. But during this pandemic alone, in the past two months, we have seen Southern legislators and the senators who support them, who also support going back to school and playing football in SEC stadiums with 100,000 people there, who are just defying the laws of science and medicine, are also proposing that you're using federal money and guess where that comes from, of course, to go to, to privilege white affluent families. So I just want to reemphasize that it is a, it, it's not a perceived threat, it is a threat, and we've seen it during the pandemic, that people are actually proposing using this money for private options. When, as Corey, you know, we can agree on NCES statistics at least, 50 million kids are in the public schools. That's money you're taking, literally, or proposed to take away, even though Supreme Court is shut down, the idea is out there. Uh, can, can well, I, I, I think that, uh, John, I think that you addressed a somewhat different question, which is fine. Uh, so uh, I think you understand the question then uh, that John just addressed, Corey, having to do with the recent allocation of the CARES Act. So could you address that question? Yeah, if you look at uh, Oklahoma is one of the states I think he, that J John is referring to, only about 5% of the total CARES Act funding went to students directly through private school vouchers. And in Oklahoma, they gave preference to low-income families. So it's not 
uh, disproportionately going to privileged families. I think more than 5% of the funding should have went directly to families. The, the funding is supposed to be for the individual students, not the government-run institutions. And as I said, you can still pick the traditional public school if that's best for you, and you should ask yourself as to why families would choose to exit the system to go to a private school or a pandemic pod if the public schools are in fact doing a good job for them. It's probably because they they prefer to do to do something else with that money. But yeah, just to get to Oklahoma, it was only 5% of the funding and they gave preference to low-income families. All right, I'm, I'm getting got several questions uh, for John that relate to the same point. I mean, guess one of them picks up on a couple of things you said, John, that you trust parents and you want to empower them. And so the question is then, if you trust parents and want to empower them, then why not offer them uh, the, uh, the savings accounts that will enable them uh, to make their empowering and trustworthy choice of where they want to send their kids? So and, that's the question. For you. So, and um, let me be, be clear about what, 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 what the resolution is that I'm arguing the affirmative for, is that it's, it, you know, it's greater investment, right, as to not further accommodate and privilege that choice. I'm not saying that choice shouldn't exist. Educational savings accounts, and I, I think uh, Dr. DeAngelis would point me in this direction, man, you can, like, that's a really good opportunity when you have the money to do it, no doubt about it, and pay for my daughter's college if I had the, the money to do that. I'm not going to deny that choice to anybody. I trust parents to make that. But I'm looking at American history to show that historically, and I mentioned this in my opening arguments, Black families and communities, Latinx families and communities, and other families of color in the United States have been historically disadvantaged. So I am putting a specific parameters around who we're talking about. I think white affluent parents are going to do just fine. I think they're going to do just fine. I'm not worried about them. I'm worried about the nearly 51 million families who admittedly don't have a choice in, in many cases, but they have to go to the local public school because they have to work two to three jobs, right? Um, so what I'm saying is, yes, I'm not taking away that choice. I think they can empower that. I think greater investment is needed to allow Black and Latinx families, if they don't even have a bank in their neighborhood that doesn't charge them extra, and research shows that this is true as well, that we need to invest in this through something like financial literacy classes. We offer this in the Freedom Schools all across the fa all across the country to families who are interested in that because when you listen to families in public schools they will say i want to take better advantage of x y and z and it requires a degree of financial literacy that is oftentimes not taught in public schools and why because they have been underfunded for decades you can't put that in the graph, the fight. You go to any school, and I'll, I'll look in Zoom camera at anybody going to a school. I will not go into a school and say, you have enough money. If you looked at Baltimore schools and Detroit schools, and, and speaking of Detroit, the Gary B, the Gary B case, right, where they're arguing that the basic fundamental right of literacy is not being offered in Detroit. Why? Dilapidated schools, textbooks. So I'm not going to go to Detroit and say, you have enough money. We're going to end what little exists, we're going to send it somewhere else. So, again, it's empowering local communities to tell us what investments they would like to see. That is correcting and addressing this dual pandemic. Well, um, to put a fine point on the question, John, as well, do you oppose uh, the proposal from the other side to give 80% uh, of the for approximately 15000 in money uh, to offer that? to all families, poor families as well, and of course, poor families, including black and Hispanic. Do you propose, do you impose that proposal to offer them the 80% savings accounts so that they can allocate it to wherever they want to send their kids? As long as we don't take funding away from the public schools themselves, yeah, I would love that additional bump for students to open the savings account, right? But as long as you're not taking that away, from students, yeah, that sounds like it. What I, the point I'm trying to make, a greater investment. So if you are giving an 80% funded savings account to each student, right? As long as they have somewhere else to go if they want to, right? My, my, my point is greater investments. It sounds like a greater investment. It sounds like it's providing some opportunity. But rest assured that there should be a public school for these students to 
go to and these families to rely on as well. Well, well but what if what if they use that eighty percent to send the kids to 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 another program outside the public school? Well, would, whatever but, again, yeah. right? It depends on the local setting. As long as that local school that they did go to and those kids who weren't making that decision, or the kids like looking at studies coming out of New Orleans, where um, in many situations, in many situations parents actually choose a school that's closest to them. So those parents who continue to choose because parity and equal opportunity does not exist, again, this isn't up for it, it doesn't exist, people are going to naturally go to that public school or research says, as long as they still have a school to go to and we're still investing in that public school, sounds great because that's fit in what my, what my, what my point is. Greater investments is needed. So if you want to tack that on, sure. Do you want to address the question, Corey? Yeah, I don't think we should fund two people for the price for for having one education. Uh, it looks like John Hill only supports school choice, even though he argues it has racist origins. If it doesn't uh, defund the traditional public school, and I will say, school choice doesn't defund public schools. Public schools defund families. School choice just returns that same money to the hands of the rightful owners, which is the family and not the institution. Um, so similarly, allowing families to shop at Trader Joe's doesn't steal money from Walmart. Why? Because the money doesn't belong to any particular institution. It's meant for that family. Same thing with the education dollars. It's supposed to be meant for, for the education of a particular child. It's not supposed to be meant for propping up and protecting a government monopoly. All right. Question for uh, you, Corey. Uh, what about students with disabilities and special learning needs? How would they pot up and receive the support they need if potting is left to market devices? Yeah, there's a lot of families with students with special needs uh, using the Arizona uh, Education Savings Account, which is targeted to students with uh, special needs. There's actually about 20 or 21 private school choice programs in the U.S. that are made and designed specifically with special needs students in mind. And with my proposal, students with special needs, since they get more money in the traditional public school system already, they would get much more money through uh, the education savings account program as well, which would allow them to uh, access a whole host of other options. Could be the private school, it could be a charter school, it could be uh, a pandemic pod option, or it could just be a regular homeschool option. It would allow the families to offset the cost of homeschooling. So that could allow for more equity by allowing less advantaged populations of students to have more money than more advantaged populations of students. And we're already seeing that happen with Prenda micro schools in Arizona uh, today. And I've already had a, a parent with a, with a special needs child on my podcast talking about her experience with that. And, and, and she saw it as a, a positive experience. Um, so I think giving families an additional option uh, for students with special needs is a, is a great idea too. And I think, um, this really uh, is a movement in the right direction, especially when uh, the public school system is a one-size-fits-all student that may not work for every individual child. And if you have unique needs, what better way than to allow those students to sort into environments that work best for them? And that still could be the public school, but I think too often the, um, you know, the federal education laws and the IEPs don't actually meet the individual needs of families in the current system. Sometimes they do, but in some cases, the, the special needs students um, may just be put into a room all, all by their, themselves and not able to interact with other students. And that uh, might not be the, uh, the scenario that works best for them. So I think giving every student a choice is, is a movement in the right direction. Do you want to comment on that question, John? Yeah, I think, you know, giving every student a choice is, is a bit misleading because it still ignores the very problems where we have in our traditional public schools. I'm not. I'm advocating for public schools, but I'm also admitting their problems. But let's say you provide a choice tomorrow to go wherever you want. We, research indicates that a lot of families are going to go to the local school because they have no other option. They don't have transfer, go, transportation to go to other schools. That choice itself is not going to work if we don't invest people to make what Corey's talking about the right choice or to use educational savings accounts the most effectively. Because as, as the part of this argument, greater investments is needed, is just to even catch people up and to raise all boats to make that choice effectively. Again, I'm not denying choice to people. I'm not denying educational savings accounts. Make that choice. But those who can't make the choice that go to the best charter schools or go to the best, you know, find the best pandemic pods in, within the city or whatever, we have to 
empower families, at times financially, but there's other forms of investment. And I know that this is a hard time for we're looking at this in non-economic terms, but sometimes it's just showing up and participating in the debates like this, right? That we need to empower these communities to even get to the plane to make the choice that we're talking about. And I continually go back to this. That's, that's the argument. Investment in people so they can be allowed and permitted and empowered to make these choices. Uh, question for you, Corey. Uh, we're, uh, we're running a bit out of time, so make it a little bit fast, both guys. Uh, aren't there fixed costs to the, uh, the structure of a public institution? And if parents opt to abandon the public school with those uh, savings account, then what about uh, those fixed costs that the uh, government made in the in the building? Yeah, all, all costs are variable in the long run, just to start out with basic economics lesson. But yes, all businesses have fixed costs, but that doesn't mean they get to keep a bunch of your money after you leave. Uh, Walmart has fixed costs. They have to keep the lights on. They have to keep uh, their buildings up and running, but uh, they don't get to keep 20% of my grocery bill each week after I leave. They don't get to keep my, a portion of my food stamps after I leave, but the public schools actually do get to keep a significant portion of dollars even after families leave because although public schools are funded based on enrollment counts, they're not entirely funded based on enrollment counts. You can look this up at Georgetown University's Edunomics Lab, and they do this for each state. And each state has, it, it's, it's on average about 60 to 80% of the funding is based on student enrollment counts. What that means mathematically is when you lose a student to school choice competition, you get to keep 20 to 40% of the funding for a student who's, who is no longer there. So the public schools actually financially benefit on a per pupil basis. Because they lose the student, they lose the cost of educating the student, but they get to keep 20 to 40% of the funding uh, each year for a student who's no longer there because they're only partially funded based on enrollment counts. Just imagine if Walmart got to keep 20 to 40% of your funding after you left. They would be happy about that. And I would argue the public schools should be super happy that they get to keep any money at all. Um, I'm afraid we're out of Q&A time. Uh, John, I think it's hopefully okay that you'll you'll have seven and a half minutes of summation to both answer that question and to summarize your argument. So uh, uh, we're going to the summary portion of the debate. Take it away, John, your summary. Okay. So again, just to real quick to just address what um, Corey's saying at the end here. Again, it's like the schools I want to send my daughters to are not Walmart's. I, I, I'm not comfortable with that. I, I'm not, you know... That, that is not an analogy that actually captures what's happening on public schools that I work with um, in the community, wherever I live. Um, it doesn't capture that reality. Schools provide mental health resources. They provide uh, medicine at times. We're, 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 we're sending kids in the direct, right direction for the health care that they need because it's not being provided in other areas. So it, it's much more than just going to Walmart to pick up, you know, Campbell's Soup or something like that. It's not that. It's, it's providing these social services. So that requires seeing outside the box a little bit in terms of per student expenditures, right? And that it's not, it's not just simply money following the child. Because if that's the case, that's much too simple. And it does not capture the reality of what public schools are on the ground. But what I want to really close by saying is bringing us back to the resolution and the resolution is actually quite simple for me, that this dual pandemic has exposed the ugly truth of racism. It exposes a deadly pandemic that has killed nearly 200,000 people after an administration even really practically denied that it was an issue, right? So it's requiring greater investment in communities that have been ravaged by that, to deny them greater investment. And again, this greater investment doesn't just have to be financial. We kept talking about, you know, per student expenditures, $13,000 per student. That's one aspect of investment. When you go to schools, if you go to a freedom school, you go to Head Start, investment means showing up, providing your own food, take, you know, taking children on a field trip. It provides finding the resources for curriculum, that's investment. It's showing up and making it happen, making, you know, making ends meet for children in schools. We need greater investment as this dual pandemic ravages America. It is, it borders, it begins to border on an extreme position to say that we shouldn't invest in our schools, we, that we shouldn't invest in programs that we know 
that black families need. So the resolution is quite simple, that we investment is needed, however you want to define it, in this specific historic moment in time of a dual pandemic, that we cannot turn our backs on these families and say, okay, here's a little bit more choice. Here's an educational savings account. It's showing up, doing the work, and pushing our public schools to right option. That's the investment that is needed. And I think, you know, if we don't do that, it privileges people who can have the social capital and the financial advantages to take the best advantage of choice. And that, more than, you know, it, telling you to vote for my proposal or, or, you know, than that, it's just, at the end of the day, we really need to pay attention, not only pay attention to these families who have been ravaged by this dual pandemic, we need to show up and listen and use their local expertise to foreign policy. They will tell us what the investment needs. Those closest to the problem of failing public schools are those I trust the most. So I ask you tonight, right, to just consider what it would mean to take the time and listen and to really go to the most ravaged communities and schools, listen to their solutions and, and, and say that we need investment. I'm here for the public schools. I am here to advocate to make sure that people who will never have a choice can go to a safe, decent place. I'm not here to take away your choice. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to advocate for public schools and empower those communities that I personally know depend on those schools. Thank you very much. And Corey, I think I just gave you a couple extra minutes. Uh there's no no capitalist trading of minutes uh, at this debate, uh, John. But thank you for your uh, intentions and generosity, uh, Corey. Uh, you go. Uh, you have seven and a half minutes to summarize your argument. Take it away, Corey. Cool. John Hale just finished by summing up his arguments pretty well, and he said that he is for here for the public schools. Well, I'm here for the public school and private school and every type of student, uh, and we should. Pre give preference to the individual students and individual families in the system, and we should not uh, prefer to help and defend a government monopoly such as the public school system. And so my counter proposal, again, for everybody is to fund the students directly and allow them to take their children's education dollars to wherever they're getting an education. And this is an anti-public school because you can still take those dollars to the traditional public school. That option is still on the table, but if for whatever reason, you should be able to take that money to elsewhere to a private school of your choosing or to a pandemic pod as well. And look, advantaged families are already taking advantage of these other opportunities School choice allows less advantaged families, and if we fund students directly, it allows less advantaged families to be able to exercise these options as well. So school choice shouldn't be limited to the rich and the powerful. It should be available to everybody in society. And education savings accounts, allowing the money to follow the child instead of the institution, uh, allows for more families to be able to have that equality of opportunity to be able to be empowered to choose the schools that work best for their children or the homeschool setting that works best for their child, whether that be a regular homeschool or a pandemic pod, and they should be able to have that choice. Um, Hale's proposal does nothing to change the poor incentives in the traditional public school system. Yeah, we could fight harder to try to invest in the system by having people talk about how things should be better. We could throw more money at the problem, but that does nothing to change the incentives of the individual schools to cater to the needs of individual families. Hale likes to point out that Walmart is not a school. I understand that, but I'm just talking about the food stamps as a funding mechanism, giving funding to families and letting families choose public uh, uh, Walmart, Whole Foods, or any other provider. That's why I also use the analogy of pre-K programs, which are also uh, uh, schooling options, and Pell Grant programs. And I'm just talking about the funding mechanism. In those cases, the funding goes to the student or the family, and the student rightly has the choice to spend that money at a public or private university or public provider or private provider of pre-K uh, in their locations. And they should have that choice, but they should also have that choice when it comes to the years in between in the K through 12 education system. Uh, a lot of um, 
John Hale's arguments were about uh, the, the supposed racist origins of school choice. Uh, I've kind of gone over how school choice has existed well before the 1900s. Three states have had private school voucher programs, and some segregationists actually opposed school choice because they knew that it would lead to more racially integrated schools. And the eight to nine studies on this topic find that private school choice tends to lead to racial integration because it allows students to leave already segregated schools. Hale admits that there are inequities in the traditional public school system, and that's a good argument to allow people to leave that inherently unequal system that does not have a strong incentive to cater to the needs of individual families. Again, my proposal is not a one-size-fits-all position, whereas Hale's proposal to stay with the traditional public school system is a one-size-fits-all position. We should allow individual families to choose learning environments based on their individual needs, which a one-size-fits-all uh, system will not uh, uh, um, address. And then also my proposal is more timely. Um, you can try to convince families to fix things, but we've already been waiting for, for uh, groups in the United States to try to fix the public school system. We've increased per pupil spending by 280% in real time since 1960, and we've almost doubled per pupil spending in real terms since 1980, and we've increased per pupil spending by 40% already in the traditional public school system by 40% uh, in real terms since 1990. So we've We've done all of this before, and we haven't changed the incentives to do a good job in the current system. What I'm arguing for allows for more bottom-up accountability at the same time as allowing for more freedom for disadvantaged groups to be able to escape that system. And they don't have to escape the system, though. They can also choose the traditional public schools. But for whatever reason that's not working for their family, they should be able to pick something else. It shouldn't. Th these choices shouldn't be limited to people who can afford to pay for private school tuition and fees out of pocket. And I will just point out 80% of the 15,000 in traditional public schools that we spend today is around 12,000, which is well over what we spend on private schools uh, for average private school tuition in the U.S., which is about $11,000 according to Private School Review's website in 2020. So this would allow for a lot of families to have a lot of different choices. And this would be good for teachers too. We already have uh, teachers opting out of the traditional public school system to teach at pandemic pods. We saw a story in Washington Post by a, uh, of a teacher in New Jersey who was in the public school system for 20 years, and then they left to do a pandemic pod. They completely left the system because they saw that there could be smaller class sizes, only six students versus the 20 to 30 to 40 students that could be in the traditional public school system, and uh, more autonomy. They didn't have to deal with all the regulations in the public school system, and they could, they could eventually end up in making more money if the money followed the child because then more of the money could get directly from the student to the teacher, and you wouldn't have to uh, spend the money on all the other uh, things in the middle. So more money can more easily get from students to teachers. And I also will say we, you know, we have spent more money in the system, but not a lot of that money has actually gone to teachers. So when you go to, you know, uh, particular school districts and see that the uh, teachers are having to buy supplies and that they're not making a, a ton of money, it's because the school district doesn't have a strong incentive because they have residentially assigned monopolies uh, to spend the money wisely. And if you look at Ben Scafidi's work on this, between 1992 and 2014, we've increased real per people education expenditures by about 27% in the U.S., but real teacher salaries have actually dropped by 2% over the same time period. And I would argue it's because the monopoly system does not have a strong incentive to spend its money wisely. And the most wise way to spend the money in the system is to allocate it towards the classroom, towards the students, and towards the teachers. So this could be a benefit for teachers. It could be a benefit for families. It could be a bene an equalizer because it can allow less advantaged families to have more options and empowerment as well. Just, yeah, just hoping the traditional public school system is going to work for everyone assumes that one size fits all. It doesn't. And it also uh, assumes that uh, advantaged families aren't going to choose to do something else. Um, and, and even if they do choose to go back to the public school system, advantaged families will probably go back into the school, the more advantaged schools, because we have inequities in that traditional public school system. So incentivizing families to return to the schools they were already going to, which are already unequal, does not lead to more equality. Funding families directly leads to more equality by allowing families who did not have the power to make these choices to now have the same, uh, more power to make individual decisions about uh, the type of school that their children will attend, whether that's a public school, a private school, or a pandemic pod option. And uh, my resolution is also more timely, and it could be more safe by spreading more children out to different locations and um, 
uh, better learning environments. And so I just want to say thank you so much, John Hale, for this uh, participating. I want to say thank you to everyone. And if you prefer my resolution to John Hale's, you will vote against John Hale's. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Corey. All right. Well, that concludes uh, the debate. Uh, Jane, please open the final vote. Again, the resolution reads, to combat inequality, greater investments must be made in public schools so as not to accommodate the formation of pandemic pods by affluent parents. John, uh, your book uh, is, uh, your book is, I guess, available on Amazon, although not yet available. You can order it on the link. Is that correct, John? Yes, John? I have two books on the Freedom Schools, uh, one uh, which you can find on Amazon, and the book on the origins of school choice will be available for Beacon, for Beacon Press. Multiple. We'll 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 post a link to that as you request an Amazon link on our on our website. Uh, and uh, while we're waiting, I did have a question, uh, at least an objection to what I've been doing. My my timer light uh, goes off occasionally, and uh, and the person who talked about how foolish this is, doesn't realize that I actually, I'm actually renting a tiny office in downtown Manhattan and I have no control over it. I don't like these things either. So please bear that in mind that it's not my choice uh, since we've been talking about choice this evening. Uh, and then while uh, the closing vote is coming in, I do want to announce that we have a debate scheduled for October 18th, Sunday afternoon, October 18th at 3 p.m., New York City time, that's our next debate. In that case, the debate resolution will read, to combat climate change, the world's nations must make it their highest priority to completely replace the burning of fossil fuels within the next 20 years. Defending that resolution will be Jeff Nesbitt, Executive Director of Climate Nexus, uh, a nonprofit that works on climate change and clean energy solutions. Jeff Nesbitt is the author of This is the Way the World Ends, How Droughts and Die-Offs, Heat Waves and Hurricanes Are Converging on America. Opposing the resolution will be Bjorn Lomborg, author of False Alarm, How Climate Change, Panic, Costs Us Trillions, Hurts the Poor, and Fails to Fix the Planet. We'll host that debate at 3 p.m. in order to accommodate the fact that Bjorn Lundberg will be in Europe, where the time will be several hours later. Again, that will be on Sunday afternoon, October 18th, and tickets are already available for that debate on our website. John and Corey, uh, you have comp ticks if you'd like to do that debate as part of our audience just as a reward for your uh, polite and energetic efforts in terms of this debate. I'm seeing Jane Metten on screen. Jane, do you have the final voting? Just send in me, thank you, Jane. Uh, and uh, I don't see it yet. Let me see, you emailed it to me, Jane? Oh, there we go, okay. Um, all right, um, okay. Uh, uh, the, uh, the yes vote. For the resolution uh, uh, having to do with greater investment in education uh, began at 15% and it went up to 20%. Congratulations, John, for, re for gaining five percentage points on that, uh, the pre and post. Uh, and, but uh, that five percentage points is the number to beat. Uh, the uh, resolution on no, the no vote, began with 45% and it went up to 75%, picking up 30 percentage points. So Corey DeAngelis wins the Tootsie Roll. Congratulations, Corey, and thanks and congratulations to you both for a spirited and courteous debate. We hope to see you soon on October 18th, and we hope all of you people can eventually come to the Subculture Theater at 45 Bleecker Street for a physical debate. John Hale, Corey, you're invited as well. We're going to that one. That'll be more fun. <laughs> Thank you and good night, John and Corey. My pleasure. Take care. Um, uh, Thanks. <laughs>